Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the ABCDE conference, uh, the special 30th anniversary edition. I think I'm one of just a few people in the room that's probably been to everyone. Uh, my name is Debbie Wetzel. I am the senior director and I oversee the governance global practice here at the World Bank. Um, it is my very great pleasure to introduce someone who actually doesn't really need an introduction, Daron Ajimolu. Uh, Daron is the Elizabeth and James Killian Professor of Economics at MIT. His expertise stretches across the full spectrum of macroeconomics with a focus on the role of institutions in political and economic growth. His work tackles some of the most daunting and critical questions facing the world today. How will institutions react to the demographic shifts of the 21st century? How will the rise of new superpowers change the global economy? How will the nature of work and employment transform as more jobs in both North America and the developing world are replaced by robotics and artificial intelligence? And how can the world's democratic institutions be protected as financial crisis, polarizing politics, and reduced wages erode trust in democracy itself? Duran's work rarely looks to tweak existing models, but rather he's constantly making us question our existing paradigms and the frames we use for analyzing the world. He's published four books, including the bestseller, Why Nations Fail, the Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty with James Robinson in 2012. He's received numerous awards and fellowships, notably including the John Bates Clark Medal in 2005, awarded every two years to the best economist in the United States under the age of 40 by the American Economic Association. And he's also won the Erwin Plan Nemers Prize awarded every two years for work of lasting significance in economics. While we don't formally deal with politics at the World Bank, it is a fundamental driver behind the effectiveness of our efforts to help our clients reach the twin goals of reducing poverty and reaching shared prosperity. Work such as Duran's has served as the academic underpinning to the repositioning of our work, of our working definition of governance as it was presented in the World Development Report of 2017 on governance and the law. This involves, this, our definition has evolved from a view purely focused on how the state acquires and exercises authority to the process through which state and non-state actors interact to design and implement policies within a given set of formal and informal rules that shape and are shaped by powers. So for us here at the bank, governance has moved from being an, a thing to being a process. And that's very important for everything that we're doing. The WDR's uh, 2017's recognition of power echoes much of Duran's work and has pushed us to better understand how power is distributed unequally in every society and that power symmetries can lead to exclusion, capture, and clientelism that undermines the core functions of institutions. This has, in turn, made sure that we continue to understand that governance reforms must take the current power asymmetries into consideration when designing policies, with meaningful change happening by shifting the incentives of those in power, reshaping their preferences and beliefs in favor of positive outcomes, and crowding in previously excluded participants into the policy-making process in order to increase contestability. Without further ado, please help me in welcoming Daron to the stage for his keynote address entitled, The Narrow Corridor to Liberty, The Red Queen and the Struggle of State versus Society. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Debbie. It's uh, my great pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be talking about a new book that uh, James Robinson and I are uh, working on or uh, hoping to be completed by the end of this year. So uh, this is sort of a dry run. So it's a little work in progress, but hopefully uh, this is a great uh, audience for me to get some comments from, but also part of what this book is about is 
really the issues of governance and through the lenses of a conceptual framework that uh, we, we hope is actually useful for thinking about a broad range of issues. Today, the world is struck by many, many problems, but perhaps the one that's been most disruptive is the uh, immigration problem that has really troubled many societies around the world. But when you actually think about it, very few people who fled uh, the Syrian civil war or Iraq or the Middle East in more broadly to Europe were leaving because of the harsh economic conditions. They were fleeing threats to their lives and livelihoods and to their families and they were fleeing the fear. And this is a picture of that fear. This is uh, uh, you know, the city of Raqqa after uh, Islamic State has raised it to the ground. And most of the way that social scientists have about thinking about this problem really starts from the inability of state institutions to do the things that they're supposed to do. Fight non-state -arm, non armed groups, stop crime, protect citizens, etc. And this looks like a textbook example. You know, the way that uh, you know, Islamic State took over large parts of uh, Iraq and Syria was because the uh, important, important branches of the state completely collapsed. So this is, for example, Iraqi army's helmets after they fled uh, the oncoming uh, Islamic State fighters. So this looks like a, a textbook case of the importance of state institutions, something that's often emphasized by World Bank practitioners and the books and reports. But the situation, of course, as you won't be surprised, is more complex. Actually, the biggest refugee crisis is not originating in the Middle East. It's originating in Myanmar. And the biggest refugee camp is not in Turkey or Lebanon. It's in Bangladesh. And uh, when you look at the situation of what happened in, Bang in, in Myanmar, it's not the lack of state institutions. It's actually state institutions themselves perpetrating the crime. Uh, a lot of evidence shows the Myanmar army was very much complicit in the uh, murder of thousands of uh, Rohingya Muslims. So this might first strike you as an extreme case, but it isn't. As many places that you can find around the world where state institutions are failing, creating insecurity, fear, violence, you see as many uh, state institutions functioning, but functioning in a way that creates a despotic fear in their people. So this is a map of uh, China with the labor camps uh, marked in. So the labor camps have recently been decommissioned, but well into the uh, reign of uh, the Chinese state, which was so successful in uh, getting economic growth going, you also had an incredible amount of repression going on in many, many different ways. And even though the labor camps have formally been disbanded, similar practices continue. But when you think about it, uh, that they have not been replaced because the despotic character of the Chinese state has ceased. On the contrary, they, it has evolved into other things. So one of those is, for example, the, uh, the prototype of the social credit system, which you can view as a way for the despotic state to control society uh, by regulating what kinds of discourses, what kind of opinions can be expressed. And this is, again, not a very uncommon thing. In fact, how uncommon, how not uncommon it is, can be seen by going back in history. One of the earliest pieces of writing that we have, the Sumerian tablets, actually tell exactly this story. So from 4,200 years ago, they tell the story of Gilgamesh, the king of Uruk, arguably the first city. And, uh, and the tablets uh, explain how this uh, city on the bank of Euphrates River was like a wonderful place. So it was uh, rich, well-governed, rampant green like copper in the sun, 
houses, the public squares, the marketplaces. It seems like, again, a textbook example of a state that's bringing both security, public infrastructure, and incentives for economic activity, and that's what the first half of the, uh, uh, the story of Gilgamesh is about. But exactly like the despotic part of the state that I try to emphasize with the Chinese or the Myanmar examples, the fly in the ointment, the catch is there. So the, the tablets continue to tell about the dark side of Gilgamesh. So who is like Gilgamesh? He is completely out of control. He likes to repress people, get his way. Nobody can object to him. Nobody can stop him. And trampling its citizens like a white bull, he does whatever he wants. No one dares to oppose him. And those are actually the characteristics feature, characteristic features of what I'm referring to as the despotic power of the state in the Chinese or the Myanmar examples. How they are going to be used, of course, is one of the things that we need to talk about. But this despotic power of the state, just like the Sumerian tablets foresaw, almost always travels with the capability of the state to actually get things done. But the Sumerian tablets were actually quite smart. Not only did they tell the story of how the two sides of Gilgamesh were creating very different problems or solving very different problems, but how we might actually try to deal with them. So citizens, bothered by this despotism trampling of Gilgamesh, cried out to heaven, to Anu, the god of the sky, to stop this despotism. So Anu came up with the first example of checks and balances in the world. So he, <coughs> so the idea was to create a double for Gilgamesh, his second self, a man who equals his strength and courage, a man who equals his stormy heart, create a new hero. And then these two will balance each other out. So a great idea, well before the US Constitution. Some people like to give credit to the US Constitution for this. But actually, it's not a great solution. It's not a great solution because even though we tell the story for the US Constitution, I don't have time to get into that, that's not really how you generally control tyrants. And even if you could control them, and in the Gilgamesh story, the, the double, Enkidu, does fight Gilgamesh, and neither can beat the other because they are each other's equal, all that fighting is not how you would like to run a society. So much better, if you could do it, not have this sort of doppelganger solution, but do something else. Shackle the Leviathan via the participation of society. And by society, I mean the people in general, the non-elites, not the politicians, not the leading businessmen, not the leading bureaucrats, just the regular people. Let them take part in politics. And let them take part in the politics in such a way that takes the edge off the worst kind of despotism, and it does so by constraining, shackling the Leviathan, the state institutions, and the people who control the state. And this is the first place where the sort of somewhat mysterious ti sounding title starts making sense. So we're going to argue that this way of controlling the Leviathan, the state institutions, is the only way you can guarantee liberty. And by liberty, what we mean is the avoidance of violence, threat of violence, or what the philosopher Philip Pettit calls dominance. So in Philip Pettit's words, dominance is something that happens when somebody lives at the mercy of another, having to live in a manner that leaves you vulnerable to some ill that the other is in a position arbitrarily to impose. So it's really about inability to make your own decisions, either because of threat of violence, actual violence, or other ways in which people other than yourself have power over you. Now, the key conceptual framework is going to be about how the only reasonable and sure way of ensuring this type of liberty is to create a balance or to exploit the narrow corridor that exists between the despotism and complete lack 
of effective state institutions. And once the Leviathan is shackled, actually something very difficult starts happening, I will argue, and that's related to the Red Queen. Once you can shackle the Leviathan, then you start using the power of the Leviathan in order to further and strengthen that liberty. So in some fortunate countries around the world, you see demonstrations like this. This is in Germany when people were trying to put pressure on uh, uh, Merkel, Chancellor Merkel, to actually take refugees from Syria. This is in the United States when people were trying to put pressure on the government to take action against climate change. And what's common against these two examples, and many others you can come up with, but not in every country, and actually a minority of countries, is two things. First, people are organizing. This is definitely putting the shackles on the despotism. Because remember, the key aspect of despotism is the ability of the state, ruler, politician, bureaucrat to make decisions without being constrained, without being forced, without consulting the rest of society. So this is one of the processes via which society can force uh, and constrain and, uh, and modify the plans of the government. But the second thing is that these people are not asking to the government to get out of the way. They're actually asking the government to take actions. And if you look at history, from US history on civil rights to European history and, uh, and, and non-European history, you see that in many instances you do not achieve liberty by some sort of absence of state. So the libertarian dream is really completely baseless. You really achieve it by using the state to create conditions of liberty. And for that, these types of protests are just one of the mechanisms for doing it. And this one of the mechanism for people to get organized in order to have a political say. So now, where the narrow corridor comes starts making sense. So trying to put these ideas in a little bit of a framework, think of this diagram. On the horizontal axis, I have power of society. On the vertical axis, I have the power of the state. When the power of society is so high relative to that of the state, and what this exactly means, I'm going to be a little bit more specific about that, you have a situation where state institutions don't function. State institutions cannot even tell people what to do. They are completely absent, disrespected. They collapse, just like the situation in Syria or Iraq. When it is that the society's power, ability to organize, ability to protest, ability to use institutions in order to have its political voice are absent or weak, then you have a situation like China or Myanmar where the state or its representatives can trample on people in the way that they want. Squeezed in between those two, between the blades of those scissors is the narrow corridor. That's where you have the shackled leviathan. And what's crucial about this is that what makes that shackled leviathan work? And remember that shackled leviathan, I argued, at least claimed, is the crucial ingredient for that liberty and also for many economic outcomes I'll come back to in a second. It's really the balance between state and society. And it's a dynamic balance. Balance, that's quite clear from this picture because if either the state or society is too powerful, you're not going to get into that corridor. But it's also a dynamic balance, and that's what those arrows are meant to convey. And that's what the Red Queen refers to. So of course everybody here is aware of Alice in Wonderland, and the Red Queen you know, explains why you have to run faster just so that you can stay in your own place. Such a great image. But in Red Queen, in, in Alice in Wonderland, that's a bad thing. It's like, like the most mindless thing. You have to keep on running, and Alice complains about it. But actually, here, the Red Queen is the guarantor for the shackled Leviathan. And the Red Queen is between, between state and society. Both of them have to run fast in order to keep up with each other. Why do you have to run? Well, because we don't live in a stationary, unchanging world. There will be continuous new conditions. And each side is always going to try to have an edge. After all, when you look at the history of state-making, that's how it comes up. People 
try to organize and increase their power over others, and that's uh, how political hierarchy gets formed. So the dynamic nature of how you remain in the corridor is by run fast in order to keep up with the other side. And that running fast needs to be done on both sides, because if the state doesn't do the running, then it's going to start atrophying and not perform its functions. You can wave goodbye to liberty. But if the society, through its institutions, organizations, protests, doesn't do it, then the outcome is going to be similar, even though you come out of that corridor in the opposite direction. So of course, I'm simplifying things here. Society, power of society, state. All of these are much more complex things than I'm making it out to be. Society is never a monolithic entity. The conflicts within society are as important as the conflict between society and, uh, and, uh, and the state or state institutions. But what I want to convey is really this balance between those who control the state and the most important sources of economic and political power in society and, <coughs> and those who do not. If you want to use a word that's become, I think, a little bit more uh, ugly since, uh, since we started using it in social science uh, several decades ago, is elites versus non-elites. But what does it mean to talk of power of society? Well, I want to be a little bit more specific about that because one of the things that I think makes such a framework potentially operational is really mapping out the power of society. And that power of society is really about this bottom-up mobilization like the protest movement, but the mechanisms for it do differ a lot. And the fact that those mechanisms change over time is a crucial ingredient or a crucial part of that Red Queen effect. So let me try to illustrate that. And let me try to illustrate that with a question first, which is, why is it that if you're a society here in the absent Leviathan part on the lower right-hand side of the diagram, why is it that you don't engineer some clever moves to get yourself into the corridor? And the answer to that is what we call the slippery slope. It's the fear of the Leviathan. And one way of telling that story is to talk about some of the ways in which societies that don't really have much state institutions have organized their, uh, their society. So one of those is the TIV in, uh, in, in Nigeria, in TIV land, and it's been very well studied by anthropologists. And the thing about the TIV is that when you look at them with our eyes uh, in the early 21st century, it seems like a crazy society. <coughs> they believe in lots of witchcraft and uh, have all sorts of weird rituals. But when you actually start peeling the outer layers of that particular onion, you realize that all of these social norms, broadly construed, have a very specific purpose. And both the anthropologists and some of their local historians have made this point, which is that they are directed against political hierarchy. So, a lot of the witchcraft is a way for the TIV to dispossess, weaken, and get rid of people who are becoming too big for their britches. So that are getting too powerful, starting to boss people around, and starting to set up a form of a political hierarchy. And you see this in every aspect of the society of the TIV, and then when you go and look at other anthropological cases or historical cases, you see traces of it, although this one perhaps is as clear as many other. One of the ways in which you see that is how the language actually is shaped. So the word that you use for powerful people in the TIV language, Tsav, is essentially, or the plural of that in itself, but is essentially the same word as witchcraft. So every power is essentially viewed as being obtained through witchcraft or nefarious means. And that sort of belief makes it very difficult for this type of society to develop a political hierarchy. So why would you have social norms like that 
Well, you will have social norms like that because if you look at history, society under after society has succumbed to some would-be strong man creating political hierarchy, concentrating power in his hands and around his group, and then start bossing people around him. And that sort of dominance, generally people are not very happy with. Even if there is the sort of hope that it might get you into the corridor, you're going to be not so happy with it. And the way that they deal with that is by nipping any kind of political hierarchy in the bud, and that's the slippery slope. Once you start allowing this political hierarchy, there is no way you can know whether you're going to be able to control it. But of course, the TIV are at a disadvantage because their way of controlling political hierarchy, these social norms, are not very scalable. You cannot say, well, let's have some sort of uh, government that's going to deliver education, and, but, but we still believe that they're witches. You can't quite do that. So you need to institutionalize this. And when you actually look at examples of societies that have really moved into the corridor, what you see is that they try to institutionalize the way in which they resist political hierarchy so that they can have their cake and eat it too. They can get some of the benefits of the state institutions but still deal with it. So one example is actually Athens. So, uh, you know, of course, th there is very little time here to get into the history of Athens, but what's fascinating about the history of Athens is the way in which state institutions formed following the ability of non-elites to start controlling elites. But even throughout this process, as they built unparalleled institutions for their time in terms of through uh, uh, assemblies to control political power, they never gave up their great fear of political hierarchy. So one of the ways in which they did that is through the uh, <coughs> ostracism law that Cleisthenes passed. And the ostracism law was essentially had the same mechanics as the TIV's approach. So what do you do in the TIV? You accuse somebody who's getting too powerful of being a witch. What do you do in Athens? You ostracize them. So the way you did that is you would write the name of that person on shards of pottery, ostracon, that's the name where the ostracism comes from, and then if a person gets their name written by enough people, they would be ostracized and exiled for 15 years. So this is from the ostracism of Themistocles. So if Athens has any hero ever, that Themistocles is it. So he saved the country twice, you know, really heroically, but then he got too powerful and they ostracized him. But the thing that's really different about Athens is that they institutionalized that. They had their parliaments, they had their state institutions, they had their ways through elections and their own media in, of actually regulating that mobilization. So this is actually one other aspect of Red Queen. So the Athenian, Athenian example is fascinating for another reason. It illustrates how the ability of the state became unmeasurably greater to do things after the state was shackled. So it was after reforms like Solon and Cleisthenes that started putting elites in their right place and under the control of non-elites or government political institutions that the state starts doing all sorts of things like having circuit court judges, orphanage systems, social so, uh, a, a sort of a pension system, <coughs> uh, coining money, regulating economic trade, uh, creating freedom of mobility, unifying policy, and, uh, and, and, and much more, much greater rationalization of the economy and the military. So that is the essence of the Red Queen that differently from Alice in Wonderland is you're not just doing a wasteful activity. This running actually gets you a much greater state capacity than you're going to be able to do under despotic Leviathan. So let me try to illustrate that with one more historical example. And then I will use that as a segue towards some of the issues that I want to put on the table for discussing for today. And I'm going to be very brief about this, but I think it's sort of useful to, to mention. You know, of course, any sort of theory that tries to talk about emergence of liberty, state capacity, state institutions, at some point has to confront how these things have come out to be very so very different around different parts of the world. So there is the European conundrum. So why is it that Europe is different? Why is it that many of these things you know, uh, have very different footprints in Europe? And theories on this abound, but this sort of theoretical perspective that I've tried to suggest, uh, propose, uh, 
<coughs> uh, suggests a different explanation. And it's not about geography, it's not about Greco-Roman culture, Christianity, Roman institutions, but it is, again, exactly about the balance of power that puts you in that corridor. And it is the balance created by the combination of two things that were not completely rare. There are equivalents of it in different parts of the world around, uh, you know, say, say uh, before the fifth century AD. But they are also not completely uh, widespread around the world. And those are Roman institutions, which were very advanced by their time in terms of the state institutions that were bureaucratized already and were capable of performing a lot of functions and, uh, and, and exercising state power, and Germanic tribal institutions. So we don't know, of course, as much as we would like about Germanic tr tribal institutions, but they seem to be very interesting. And one of the most interesting things about them is that they were based on assemblies. So many important decisions were made in assemblies, which means that people had to come and give their consent to important decisions. And they had the right to, people had the right to depose kings or oppose decisions of the elite. And, uh, <clears throat> and these go back probably quite a long time. Tacitus, although he's not always a reliable guide, but on this there is no reason to think that he was lying or making things up, he talks of the, uh, <clears throat> of the Germanic tribe having two very common assemblies, one of ma matters of minor importance where chiefs participate and one major affairs where the whole community participates. And it seems like these assemblies were become, had become institutionalized by the time that the Western Roman Empire collapsed. And uh, this is Hinkmar, on, Hinkmar of Reims in, uh, in his tract he wrote for Carloman II, uh, newly crowned king, and he's telling how the Carolingians were doing these things. Actually, these go back to the Merovingians before then, and, 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 uh, and you'll see that the language is very similar to Tacitus's, meaning he talks of these two assemblies, and he uh, instructs Carloman as a new king that it's not your job to tell people what to do. You have to listen to them, and you have to listen to these assemblies. And... Uh, and the other blade, of course, is, as I mentioned, uh, Roman institutions. And the interesting thing is that uh, after the collapse of the, uh, <coughs> of, the, of, the, of the Western Roman Empire, you know, a lot of the Mero Merovingian and then following the Carolingian project was bringing these two blades together, sort of fusing the assemblies without destroying the assemblies, partly perhaps because they, were, did, not have the, they did not have the power to destroy them bringing them together with Roman institutions. And a lot of the Christianity was really a functional response in order to be able to do this marriage. And it's interesting, and this is one of the things that I would like to emphasize, I mean, I, I, uh, we, we do emphasize in the book, in passing, I want to mention it here, is that you know, one of the telltale signs of despotic states and states inside the corridor is how they do deal with law. So when you look at the despotic states, the laws are imposed as the will of the emperor or the ruler. And it's, a, it's viewed as a, as a tool for the ruler to control society, like, just like the social credit system of the Chinese. Whereas the way that you know, uh, Clovis or King Alfred in England did that is that throughout they emphasized these were laws that society had and they were just codifying them. So they weren't the law imposers. Other people were the lawgivers. They were just being subjected to those laws, and they were the translators of the laws. Now, uh, one of the interesting things is how these were translated, trans transferred to the British Isles by the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes in the form of Witans. Witans are these assemblies, and you see them all over uh, England during the Middle Ages, and you see exactly the same role of the Witans, disposing, uh, deposing of kings, constraining kings, and so on and so forth. And interestingly, the Magna Carta is a continuation of this trend. That's not in, in, the, in the place, the birthplace of modern neurocracy. Rani Mead is uh, the meadow of the Ritan. That's what it means. It's actually, they're holding it in an old parliament place. Now, when you start looking at the path of state formation in England this way, the perspective change is actually quite useful. So many uh, social scientists, some of them influenced by Huntington and, and other sort of uh, thinkers who have 
argued that the important thing is the imposition of political order from above, have interpreted British state building in a very different light. But actually, the truth looks much more like the Red Queen than the Huntingtonian path of imposition. So both early on, for example, during the reign of Henry VII, Henry VIII, you see a lot of the initiatives for state building, public infrastructure, crime dealing, judges, uh, taxes, they come from the bottom, and the state itself has to react to these things. So, uh, for instance, uh, Hindle's work and many other Bar Braddock's work documents all of these things happening in, 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 uh, uh, <coughs> in, 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 in individual villages. You see the same thing in the 18th and the 19th centuries. The uh, involvement of people, and this is Charles Tilley's work on the popular contention in British politics, is very, very important for the formation of these institutions. And you can see that both of these legs are important because in places where you have the Germanic institutions but not the Roman institutions, like Iceland, <coughs> you have none of this. Iceland has its own assemblies, but no state, and then uh, uh, soon becomes completely mired by feuds and lawlessness. And you don't have it in the Byzantium, which is, of course, the uh, continuation of Roman institutions very strongly, but you have no development of the shackled Leviathan precisely because you don't have these assemblies, these bottom-up processes. And when you look at around different parts of the world, for example, as in China, you don't see the uh, the the equivalent of these assembly politics, these bottom-up institutions that constrain, and as a result, you have a very different type of state institution development path. Now, whether there were ever any of these sort of <coughs> bottom-up policies, uh, there's some debates in the literature, but the important thing is that by the time of, the, uh, of this gentleman, Shang Yang, uh, who uh, for the formed the legalism idea, uh, none of that was left, so, uh, and, uh, and the motto that that Lord Chang sort of uh, formulated is that it was very important for the people to be weak and the state strong. So it was the ability of the state to keep people weak was very important. Now, that doesn't mean that you cannot have any economic growth. You can have what we call despotic growth, growth led by the state, but you're not going to have any of this liberty and this despotic growth <coughs> is not going to have any of the same durability, although it can last for decades sometimes, for example, under the Song Dynasty, but it's not going to have the same long-run Red Queen type of path that you do see in the European case. And it's not just about the European case. There are several non-European cases that illustrates this. Now, what lessons can we have about societies that are more likely to be able to form these sorts of political and thus economic development path. Again, ideas in social science are, are very, uh, are abundant on this. One of them, for example, by Charles Tilley is that war making is very important. Some modern social scientists have ex exactly decried the absence of enough wars in Africa and Latin America because that meant the state has remained weak. Uh, but Others have talked about geography, some kind of economic activities, crops, different cultures, charismatic leadership. But this framework emphasizes that none of these are, is going to have widespread applicability. And the reason is very clear from this figure. Things are non-monotone, meaning that if I make the state stronger and move upwards, and if I were starting below the corridor, that could be a very good thing because it can get you into the corridor. But if you are already in the corridor and I make the states a little stronger, it's going to get you out of the corridor. So the threat of state in Switzerland was very important in bringing the Swiss Confederacy together. But the threat of the state for Prussia was very important for forming the Prussian, Prussian depth, despotism and completely destroying the more participatory institutions of the Holy Roman Empire that existed in Brandenburg and uh, Prussia. The same thing is true for any of these other structural factors, exogenous factors. All of their effects are going to be conditional. It's going to depend on which part of, the of that framework, uh, of that uh, phase diagram you are in. So what matters then? Are there any 
characteristics of societies that will make the emergence of that corridor of the shackled Leviathan and the Red Queen dynamics more likely? And the answer is yes. One is any sort of factors that make the corridor less or more narrow is going to matter. So if you look at these two figures, it's going to be much harder to remain in the, enter the corridor and remain in the corridor on the left than on the right because the corridor is wider. So therefore, this sort of framework suggests that the role of structural factors is not these sort of, oh, when you have states, you, when you have war, you have states, but it's just how does it change the shape of these curves in this figure. And one, for example, that's important, so there are a couple that I've listed here, but uh, one that's important, for example, is labor coercion. So the more coercive economic activities are, the narrower is the corridor. Why? Because then whatever power one group obtains wants to use them for its economic benefits through coercive activities. Globalization effects are much more nuanced here because globalization can make the corridor narrower or broader, depends on what sort of specialization it induces. So this is uh, my last two, three minutes, knowing that I was going to be short of time. Of the two things that I wanted to talk about, I opted for the second. The first one was, well, what can we say here about countries that are outside the corridor about moving inside the corridor? That turns out to be a little bit more complex, but I want to say something that's quite relevant for many developed countries today, including the US. Once you are in the corridor, well, you can easily come out of it. What are the things you can do in order to prevent coming out of it? And the answer is, it's really all about Red Queen. And to illustrate that, I'm going to talk about Frederick Hayek, who, of course, contributed a lot to some of these thinking. And, uh, but the way that he wrote the uh, road to serfdom is very interesting. In the road to serfdom was his response to the beverage report of 1942. The beverage reform was a, essentially the British equivalent to what the social democrats in Scandinavia were doing, strengthen the state, taxation, redistribution, uh, <coughs> uh, organizations of, of, of labor, and so on and so forth. And Hayek thought this was a terrible idea. Many people thought different. So for example, James Griffith, who was the minister after after, uh, after the war, said in one of the darkest hours of the war, in the end of 1942, the beverage report fell like manna from heaven, mobilized everybody. And during the war, it started being implemented. So Hayek disagreed, even though he was friends with William Beveridge. And, uh, and he argued, essentially, with the language that could be out of our book, saying, no, be careful about strengthening the administrative capacity of the state, because then you're going to weaken freedom. And he was rep unrepentant on this, even in the uh, 15 years after the publication of the book. This is from the preface to the US edition, where he says uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, that new institutions and policies will gradually undermine and destroy the spirit of society. So instead of spirit of society, put the bottom-up mobilization of society. And he's talking about the state getting too strong. But he was wrong. And the reason, the reason why he was wrong is because his thinking, though actually it was very similar to ours, was not dynamic. He did not factor in the Red Queen effect. So in particular, what I mean by that is that he essentially said society has its power. If the state gets stronger, then it could dominate society. But a different way of thinking about it is that if the state gets stronger because it's taking on new responsibilities, then society can organize in different ways in order to strengthen its own capabilities. And that's exactly what happened in many of the examples, Britain to some degree, but even more strongly in the Scandinavian. You see the new ways of society to check the bureaucratic capacity of the state develop. So therefore, I think where I want to end is that I, uh, one of the ways in which general social science can be useful is to give us ways to think about how <coughs> society, state, organizations respond to new exigencies. Technologies change all the time, the organization of the world economy, security threats, movements of people, those are all new conditions. But I think one way we can sort of reason about these things is how can we ask the most powerful institutions that we have, state institutions, to play more of a role in response to some of these challenges while at the same time controlling them so that they don't get out of control. <clears throat>
So this is in the sense in which the Red Queen is in the title of the book because Red Queen really shapes the way that we think about this, which is the dynamic adjustment of society through its institutions, not just its institutions, through its social norms and institutions, through its mobilizations, in order to be able to allow the state to have a greater role to deal, to protect liberty, to deal uh, with new uh, economic conditions to create better economic opportunities, but at the same time, society through its bottom-up processes still control the state. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. So very interesting ideas uh, related to balancing between state and society, um, the role of uh, power from the bottom up. I opened by saying we thought of power from the top down, so an interesting contrast. Um, I have tons of questions, but I think I'll leave it to the audience since I see the, the line forming. Uh, we have about 15 minutes, so what we'll do is we'll go in uh, groups of three, please. Um, and I would ask you if you could please be mindful to keep your questions brief so we can get as many people in as possible. And start by introducing yourself. Thanks so much. Thank you, and thank you for a great presentation. My name is Ricardo Habalian. I work here at the World Bank. Uh, my question is related to something that you hinted at on how we get countries into that corridor. Hopefully, there's a role for policy, and we don't have to wait 1,200 years between the fall of the Roman Empire and a revolution. So if you could talk a little bit about that, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. I'm a recent graduate uh, of Duke University. Uh, I'd like to go back to Europe. You talk about Europe, how is the Czechoslovakia? So my question is about what do you think about uh, revolution in England in 1642 and 1789 in French? Do you think that's a Czechoslovakia shape? Thank you. One more, please. Oh, we'll let Francois come in too. Okay. okay. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Sergio Martinez, and I am coming from 3IE Impact, the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation. I wanted to follow up with you in the in the in the sense of tra transitioning from civil societies to have a greater mobilization and, and institutional institutionalization. So my question is, how would you describe the transitional pathway for civil societies to be more sustainable in organizing themselves and also be more influent to governments in transparency and accountability to public policy action? Thank you. Francois, welcome back. Hi, Darren. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for a very inspiring uh, presentation. And uh, sorry to attract uh, your attention on the technical part of it. I must say I'm a bit uh, hesitant about the way in which to interpret your basic uh, diagram and uh, the corridor and uh, the uh, Red Queen over there. Uh, my point is simply to uh, say that the power of society and the power of the state cannot, be, cannot go to infinity. Uh, and, and the way in which the, the picture is being presented is, is, is like that. So it seems to me that what you are really insisting upon is the relat relative power of the state and the society. And uh, to some extent, you could represent all these things on a, on a, on a, on a, on a segment, on, a, on in one dimension. And in that case, you would be missing some dynamics. And the point is that uh, when you refer to the Red Queen, indeed there is dynamics because you have shocks in the system, what you said, and because of that, either the power of the state or the power of the society is being reduced, and, uh, or in relative terms. And then there must be an effort for one side or the other to come back to the corridor. But uh, I think that to insist on the dynamic aspect of the of the whole process is really quite important. And on top of that, I think that you would like to introduce in these dynamics a sense of social progress uh, that uh, is being sought by uh, the society at least, uh, uh, maybe uh, a little less by the state. But I think it is a very, very nice uh, representation and I think that everybody will be failing, falling in love with the Red Queen. Okay. Thank you very much. For if, the if you just wait, we'll do. Let him answer these and take uh, another round in just a few moments. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the questions. So uh, many varied questions. So let me uh, let me focus on some of them in greater detail. So I think the first question I think is very important, which is about getting in. And uh, unfortunately, 
the reason why I didn't talk about it is that there is no formula for getting in. But when you go through a number of cases, as we do in the book, what you see is the importance of forming new coalitions in order to transition a, uh, a, 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 an entry into the corridor. And why do I emphasize the role of coalitions? Because, and this actually links to the French Revolution question. Uh, you know, French Revolution is of course complex, but one of the sort of simple ways of reading the French Revolution is you see sort of an attempt to change the institutions and then chaos ensues because some groups, uh, you know, in the simplest telling around Robespierre, for example, are complete, become completely unconstrained and then, and then you know, uh, this sort of brings out the terror. So the, the importance of coalitions is precisely that. So whenever you are trying to enter into the corridor, the key is you stay in a situation of balance. But if the entry into the corridor is one group or one individual forcing you in it, then how do you control that individual or that group? So the more important, simpler at least examples of that sort of behavior always has a relatively broad coalition. So going back to the example that the, the second question uh, uh, asked about, the, 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 the glorious revolution of uh, uh, <coughs> 1692. You know, it's not one individual or one part of the aristocracy or, or, the, or the merchant class, but a broader group of people trying to uh, rein in King James II. And, uh, and that sort of broad coalition formation is very important, and, uh, and you see that in many of the examples. The other uh, commonality that comes out when you are thinking of examples of societies or uh, cities uh, moving into the into the corridor is to, to have a version of the Red Queen effect play out also. So what I mean by that is in many cases when you are outside of the corridor you have the twin problem that <clears throat> the state is despotic and society doesn't trust the state. So because the society doesn't trust the state Whatever power the, society, uh, the state has, it's also being trying to sort of uh, uh, the, uh, people, groups in society are trying to neutralize that power. So one happy scenario, not easy to engineer, but when it works, very powerful, is that if you can change the trust that society has of the state, and back that up with the real sort of institutional controls or other controls, then you open the way for greater embrace of the power of the state, which then enables the state to use its power in more positive ways, at the same time in the process strengthening society so that it, it sort of keeps up with the state. So you see that in a number of examples, especially at the local level. And then that I would like to bring to, uh, to Francois's question. So, so Francois's question is driven by a view that the picture I put is a pure competition contest. So actually what I was trying to capture is that it's both competition and cooperation. So therefore, that's why not everything can be reduced to a relative state power, a single dimensional variable. And, uh, and having both the state and society at zero or very, very low power is not the same as having both state and society at a power close to one. And fortunately, we have the th that theoretical framework worked out so that we can actually give an answer. So mathematically, the way that it works is precisely because the state and society's powers contribute to the degree of surplus or economic activity. And the dynamics comes from, because you're taking the state variables and you're building on them, but while you're building on them, that relative is always in your mind because the weaker you are relatively, the more you want to sort of race in order to catch up. But so, the, the, so the, the, what you were anticipating in terms of the uh, contest is there. 
and the reason why you have this corridor is precisely because of this discouragement effect. So when you are neck and neck, you have more, you know, think of it like a tennis match. If it's neck and neck, you have more incentives to put effort, but if you fall behind the other guy, you give up. So that's essentially the thing, but together with this cooperative element built in. And that cooperative element, even though I did not have time to talk about it, is actually quite important, because if you actually look at, the, again, the historical examples, a lot of it takes place with, the, with society believing that it can control the state, giving a long leash to the state. So if you imagine, for instance, the difference between the Scandinavian state and the American state. The Scandinavian state has much greater ability to be intrusive, has access to information about individuals to a much greater degree, but Scandinavian citizens accept that because they believe the state will not do wrong things. Why do they believe they don't do the wrong things? Well, in this theory, it's because they believe in their ability to mobilize and through elections and other means control the state. American history is much more complex. It's always had this distrust of the state going back to the South's uh, reaction to the U.S. Constitution and uh, its def defense of slavery, which it's so, again, in line with what I was saying about liberty, that, you know, uh, slavery could be kept only with weak federal power. So the, 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 uh, the distrust of the state is much more pervasive, but that keeps both the state weaker than uh, in, in some dimensions than, than you are able to achieve in, say, the Scandinavian countries. Let's do a quick second round. Uh, the gentleman there, and I'm going to, while he's standing up, I have a quick question. You talk, you talk very much about history and the balance of state power versus society's power, and you noted the, 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 the Chinese citizen score. I'm curious as to your perspectives on how technology going forward changes the power of society in ways we haven't foreseen. So whether it's through distributed cooperation on a horizontal way, what does that mean in, in some way as we think forward? Uh, please go ahead, sir. And then uh, uh, be very brief because we have about five minutes left. So if you want to hear responses, yeah. you need to leave. Thank you. My name is Giovanni Retrito. I work for the Italian government. And I want to ask you, uh, if we go back to Montesquieu theory, we see that there was an attempt to, to have a, uh, a separation of powers in the institution of the states that had a parallel in the uh, powers of the societies with the executive power in the hands of the king and the uh, legislative power in the hands of aristocracy. Uh, don't you think that uh, nowadays, especially in mass societies, and especially in states like Italy, where the, uh, there is no tradition of faith in the state, there's a need of a, a more clear separation among the powers, so political power, economic power, and information power. Thank you, Prof. Mogli. My name is Ramesh Vaidya, former member of the Planning Commission of Nepal. In terms of the balance of power, it seems to me that uh, in the context of governance and development, it essentially becomes a question of how to balance power between the local institutions and the central institutions. And here we have a case where the local institutions have less organization and less resources, and central institutions have a lot of organization and a lot of resources. So ultimately, is it possible to encourage in developing countries some kind of polycentric governance where the system itself requires maintaining a balance of power and resources between the two? Hi, Bill. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, Daron, you started with the idea of dominance as an individual concept, that the individual should not be dominated by somebody else. But that I'm not sure what happened to individual rights in the, in the rest of the presentation. The, the society could also become powerful enough to oppress individuals, like social norms could be oppressive to ethnic minorities or gays or women or lots of different categories of people with unpopular behavior. And sort of what is, what is left to protect the individual against both the state and society? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So those lots of uh, great questions. So let me start, Debbie, with yours on China and uh, technology. So I think that uh, is very, very interesting. You know, about <clears throat> 10 years ago, there was this sort of view that technology, Facebook, 
Twitter, they're just going to increase the uh, ability of people to participate in politics and, uh, and, and democratize everything. And of course, what we have seen in the process is that, you know, it's a two-edged sword, uh, whatever, you know, it's not just, you know, Russian hackers and, uh, and, and bots on Facebook, but much more, you know, against the Green Revolution in Iran, in China, the state is capable of using technology and the NSA much more effectively than in a decentralized fashion. So, so I think, I actually think that on the whole, with technology probably Desp despotic power of the state is at an advantage. The only sort of uh, r difference, the only, not difference, but the only sort of exception to that is new technology. So when, you know, uh, something that a new way of encrypting things comes up before it's taken over and dominated by the state with, or the NSA or the Chinese government, that creates a window. So, so I think we cannot just rely on technology or anything like that again, ex with the exception of this like little breathing space that perhaps some new technologies create. And that I bring back again to saying that a broader mobilization of society in political sphere is crucial. On the separation of political, economic, and information power, yes, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, I was a little bit flippant on checks and balances uh, at the beginning when I was talking about Gilgamesh. Uh, I didn't mean to sort of imply that separation of powers or checks and balances are unimportant, but I wanted to, what I wanted to emphasize, and, and that's how I would respond to your question, is that they need to be grounded in societal participation in politics. So the way that many constitutions were written in Latin America, for example, uh, which I think was a misinterpretation of the American Constitution is, well, let's introduce checks and balances and everything will be fine. And that's, all, that's completely incorrect because many of those constitutions, like the way that, for example, many of the founding fathers thought at the same time, let's also make sure that people cannot participate in politics very easily. So many of the founding fathers were no, uh, no big fans of democracy but they didn't have it their way, and, and what's distinctive about U.S. Constitution is not just the separation of powers, but the inability of elites to actually keep, uh, you know, the democratic process completely under control. So, so in that sense, separation of powers is extremely useful when it's grounded in that sort of uh, societal participation and there, you know, separating political power and economic power I think is very important, but I'm not sure that I would set that as like a rule that you wouldn't want to break because again, depending on the, as the conditions change, the role of the state may need to change and you may need to have greater role for the state in redistribution and that's essentially what, you know, to Hayek's uh, great chagrin, that's what many of the social democratic governments did and did quite successfully by changing the political balance in society also. Local institutions and central institutions, uh, I think that's very important. Uh, and I agree with you that in the context of the developing world, and that's why I, in passing I refer to cities, local institutions or local organizations is something that's much easier to achieve for two reasons. First of all, social norms are going to be much more helpful for that. And second, they will be less threatening to dictators and uh, authoritarian rulers. So it creates a sort of breeding room for that. But I would also say that what I'm suggesting is not a, uh, that the power of the state is central and the power of society is local. Actually, the Athenian example was meant to convey that after a while, if you want to scale up the ability of society to control politics, you really need to make them central also. So it's not, you cannot just have all politics is at the village level or at the municipality level or at the mayor level. You really need to have the federal institutions in countries like the US or Germany or Brazil or India, where these federal institutions part create <coughs> pathways for people from the bottom up to have their voices, to have their constraints felt. And finally, on Bill, yes, absolutely. Uh, I did not have time to talk about that, that, but that's one of the things that we try to tackle in the book. And uh, outside of that corridor, you have dominance coming from two sources. 
you have dominance coming from the despotic power of the state, and you have dominance coming from when state is absent. So, uh, so we spent quite a bit of time, both in, uh, in the historical development of the state and more uh, on the, in the 20th century, trying to emphasize that <coughs> uh, weak states or absent states are actually quite the opposite of the liberty because you always have some natural inequality and that some of it comes from social norms, some of it comes from natural ability differences or physical differences and, and lawlessness or absence of some centralized conflict resolution mechanisms is actually extremely uh, bad for many, many people's liberties or protection against violence or the threat of violence. So, and then we quite talk a, little, a lot about in the later parts of the book how you can sort of reinterpret some of the populist movements in this light. Okay, so Daron, thank you so much. I think you've assured a book launch here at the bank <laughs> with uh, many copies being sold. Fascinating ideas relevant to much of what we do in many different ways. Uh, just remains to thank the round of applause for Daron. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I love trying to pack too much. <laughs>